Welcome to Edward Christian Church. How y'all guys doing? Blessed. Blessed. Too blessed to be stressed. Amen. You have to remind yourself that sometimes. Too blessed to be stressed. Amen. Amen. Yeah. How many here have come through some hot weather lately? <laughs> it, it, it's hot up here too today. We got air conditioning on, but my air conditioning is a little different than this week. All right. Let, let's stand up and say this together. Spiritual warfare is 10% Satan's tactics and 90% time to respond. Y'all remember that when I start preaching today. Remember what? Remember that. Remember, we, with God, we are not helpless, hopeless, but we are powerful. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Don't pray. Why are you standing? We didn't get to sit down because we can we get ready to jump into some praise and worship. But say this. These are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish them. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one. Accept my worship, O oh Lord. Give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Let's get ready. Let's get ready to sing a little bit. Y'all ready to worship a little bit? <clears throat> Church said, 
Isn't God good? All the time. God's good. Get your Bibles now. We're celebrating our nation's independence this week. We're also going to celebrate our, listen carefully, independent dependence. Independent dependence. Independent in the sense that we're no longer held captive to sin, but we're dependent because we need God to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Amen? Amen. So, so, our independent dependence. Y'all say that with me. Independent dependence. And we're, gonna, we're not going to talk about that today necessarily, but in a way, yes, yeah, because it's part of spiritual warfare. Get your Bible out. God is so good to us. First Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> God is so good. Can you play piano on the communion, bro? Can you play piano on the communion? Okay. Here we go. We're going to have some, just about all kinds of things going on today. It's good stuff. First Corinthians chapter 11, For I received the Lord that was also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which we were betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do is all as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you to show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so that he eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. But it's called many weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. If we would judge ourselves, we should not. Be just. Just where you end this way. <clears throat> Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, that you have us in the palm of your hand. I thank you, God, right now, Lord, that something special is taking place right here, right now. I know, Lord, maybe the congregation today may be small in number, but we're big in heart. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch us, Lord. God, is there anything within us that you do not like? I ask you to reveal it to us and take it away. <laughs> Father, if there's any actions or any attitudes that are not pleasing in your sight, I ask you right now, Lord, to step in and take care of business. I ask you, God, to help us to be ready to my God because we know that you can come back at any time. Father, we thank you for that and for all that you do for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Brother Doug, you come here, brother. Now, we got communion two different ways. We've got the old-fashioned way, and we got the, we got the other. The, the, the still have the one with the uh, do-it-yourself. All in one. So the choice is yours. Whichever way you want to do it, whenever I come up, and either you can participate with the bread and the, and the juice, or you can pick up a cup. Either way, that's up to you, totally. And that, that, again, that's, that's between you and God. But either way it works. Amen. Uh, I, I, not long ago, there was a lady dying in my community, and she wanted to see her daughter baptized. <clears throat> she was so sick, they couldn't come here to the baptism. And so, so it's amazing. <clears throat> When they sent the woman home and said, I don't know how much longer she's going to have. Let not let not went over there. I haven't carried a baptism road from here and put on her daughter. It was a room full of people. Because nobody was expecting this. They are all in there with her. And we got a chance to baptize her daughter. So we had to go to the penitentiary center, I poured a cup of water on her head, and catch her with a towel around her neck. And I told her, I said, you're just as baptized if you were in River Jordan. And that was one of the last things her mama saw before she died. God's mercy. God's amazing. We can trust God. No matter what, we can trust Him. 
Amen. So again, it's up to you. We'll pray for this. And and again, however you want to do it, it's fine with us. We'll, we'll, we'll serve you either way.
Our sister Vicky gets okay too. All right, y'all ready? Yeah, I, Vicky's not here, but this is the new book. Y'all ready for the new book? I don't believe it. <laughs> there was a fire in the convent. One retired nun on the fourth floor was trapped by the flames. The resourceful sister quickly took some robes from her closet, tied them into the rope, and descended to safety. An amazed reporter later asked her, weren't you afraid that your makeshift rope might fall apart? And she said, oh no, my brother, old habits are hard to break. <laughs> All right, that was good. 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 going to talk about today too, so that's how it works out good. I did a big broken in my house last night, <laughs> and he started searching for money, so I got up and I searched with him. <laughs> Both of us left disappointed. Okay, I should have stayed with the nun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh oh. Somebody's feet stink. And Eddie is not you right now, although he is wearing flip flops. Somebody's feet stink. How much you notice that gas mask that person is wearing? The gas is on the inside, not on the outside. You got to pay close attention to that. The gas is on the inside, not the outside. Step in what? <laughs> This is part one. Slam, slam, up to, <laughs> slam up to where? Slam up to where, that's right. <laughs> okay. Get your Bible out. Well, you didn't have your Bible. I'm going to put it up here, but you can get your Bible out if you want to, okay? But, but it's going to be John 13. All right. It, it was the eve of the Passion. Jesus is about to forego one of the most terrible punishments a man can go through. Matter of fact, he's not just going to get, there's two types of capital punishment. One, you can, one is a possibility of walking away from it. The other one, there is no possibility. The scourging you can walk away from, possibly. But the cross you never walk away from. That's why Pilate gave him the scourging first, hoping that they would leave him alone so he could walk away, but he didn't. And he got the cross, so he got double. He did double duty that day. So it's some very powerful, powerful stuff. You've seen the movie The Passion. They actually underplay what actually happened. If you look at all the research and looking at the bodies that have been hung on the cross and the way nails were in their bones and the way things were twisted, they underplay it in The Passion compared to what actually happened to them. So this is something very powerful. Getting ready to take place in his life. The disciples had been with Jesus over three years. They learned a lot, but actually, they had a head knowledge, but not very good heart knowledge. They still had some stuff going on in their head, they're trying to figure it all out, but it hadn't reached the heart yet. It hadn't reached their spirit. And so now, here's Jesus, he knew he didn't have much time left. Now you would think, he's getting ready to go do what he's going, but you would think, that he needed, that, that, that he would really be worried more about the support of his friends. Look at this. He's really needing them. And instead of asking Jesus why can they do to help him, they're arguing. Have you ever seen church folk argue? <laughs> they're arguing. They all got wrong attitudes. And this attitude it is pervasive, it's going through, it's taken up, it's just invading the room. And so in this room where Jesus is needing somebody to comfort him, they're sneaking up the place. And have you ever been there? You really need somebody to come in and comfort you and all of a sudden they land blast you? Or you need somebody to come in to join in prayer with you and they tell you how you're so silly to believe that God would actually do that? And so, so the same way with that kind of support system, Jesus is needing help, but Jesus is getting no help. But he knew, instead of going, fellas, I'm going to need you right now, tighten up. Instead, he says, you know what? Let me get ready to get my last lesson. 
It's amazing that it's his last lesson. Usually, to think of the last word of somebody is very important. It means something very powerful because people know that they're dying and they know that they have to make that, some, some, they know they have to make that statement. Others, they may not realize they're dying, but as they make that dying declaration, people can use that in court. So here, instead of that dying declaration, he's going to fix their attitudes. Somebody, <laughs> I dare you, I'm going to dare you right now. Put your hand up, I dare you. Point your hand at the person beside you. Y'all ready? And say, Lord, fix. Lord, Lord, Lord fix. My attitude. My attitude. Y'all both said their attitude, didn't you? <laughs> fix my, my attitude. attitude. All right. So here we go. Y'all can remain seated for this. Oh, there you go. See? See? He knows that he got to drive this hard lesson. Because they're in there, you got their gas masks is being attacked from the inside. It's amazing how, you know, my dad used to tell me, son, you better take a shower. I said, why, dad? He said, because when other people smell you, he said, well, you smell, he said, by the time you smell yourself, some other people have been smelling you for about three days. I never tried that, but I can promise you I don't want to try that. Let me So, so they're stinking from the inside out. So here we go. Let's get ready. The ultimate lesson, and I've talked about this lesson so, so many times over the years, we, we're going to take a different kind of spin on it. Ready? Now, before the Passover feast began, Jesus knew or was fully aware that the time had come for, for him to leave this world and return to the Father. And as he had loved those that were, were his own in the world, he loved them to the last and to the highest degree. That's pretty obvious because instead of aggravating them to how they're acting, he's saying, Y'all need to be helping. He says, you know what? I don't have much time left. So I'm going to give them a mega, mega lesson. So it was during supper, Satan already put the thought of betraying Jesus in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that Jesus, knowing fully aware that the Father put everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was now returning to God, got up from supper, took off his garments, and took a servant's towel. He fastened around his waist, then he poured water in the water basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the servant's towel with which he was girded. These guys are amazed. They can't believe what they're seeing because the master, the rabbi, the anointed one has got down and pulled off his outer garment, put on that towel, and without saying too much, said more than they'll want to hear. He said more than they can even bear because of the lesson that he was about to teach. Now, now let me just show you this. There was a lot of fullness that was going on there uh, uh, during this time. He said, a new commandment I give you, this is a little bit later, a new commandment I'll give you, love one another as I have loved you. So much you love one another. He says this after he teaches this lesson. You see, the fullness of this lesson is so full, it's so rich. Because first, watch this. It was the fullness of time. He knew that he had done what his father had said to do. The destiny, he knew he was getting ready to die, he was getting ready to go back to the father. He's got to die for that to happen. He knew that he had accomplished what he was sent here for. Because this night was going to be the pivot in the doorway to the cross. But the biggest full thing he did, when I say full, it's like F-O-O-L, is F-U-L-L. -L. The great fullness that he did of all was give this example. This is the full example of love is to serve, not to be served. I gotta say that again. The full example of love is not to be served, but is to serve. And it's one thing 
when you're serving those close to you. That's still a servant's heart, and it needs to be there. Very powerful. You want a marriage to work, it better be there. You want a family to work, it better be there. But now you get on your job, and you want your job to be successful. You want to have a good team, it better be there. You know, my wife is watching 60 Days In, and they're in Bebop. And she's hearing all the, all the rackets, all the fight, and all the stuff that's going on there. And again, she said, is that real? I said, that's real. Everything you see is real. There's nothing that got me. The guy's talking on the camera. They may be, be doing a little boasting a little bit, but other than that boasting, everything is real. What you see is what happens. And she said, wow. I can't imagine going in there. And all I can think about is, every time we go in there, we go in there with a the towel. The tension arms go in there with a the taser and a mace. But when we go in there, we bring a towel. The tension officers tell us all the time, said, dude, did your people leave? He said, we got peace in the block for about two or three days. You know why? Because we didn't bring a taser. We didn't bring the gas. We brought the towel. We showed the full example of love to some folks that we didn't even know. So now, watch this. Again, we finished reading this now. John 13, 7 to 11, Jesus said unto him, You do not understand now what I'm doing, but you will understand it later on. There's a lot of things God does for us. We don't quite get it. And then one day you're riding down the road, or one day it's an opportunity to do it again, and all of a sudden you go, Wow, that's so ah! Oh yeah, there it is. Peter said unto him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus said unto him, Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. You have no share in the companionship of me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head too. And Jesus said unto him, Anyone who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he is clean all over. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop. You're taking a bath, you're clean, but your feet stink. Now we all got friends that our feet stink. Every now and then you ain't got to raise your hands if your feet ever stump. And then we had a guy one time in church, bless his heart, he had a stinking feet anybody ever smelt in my entire life. And one day I was preaching and, and everybody over this side of the church went, I saw my watch start going. And pretty soon they all got up and moved. I kid you not. It's never done one guy. And I said, what in the world is going on? So I started walking down the aisle preaching them, but I was gonna say, and the Lord said, I hit him with glory. I found out he had taken his shoes off and he was just fanning his feet. Woo! You know, that might have been a funny story later on. When it happened, it was not funny. And when it's us when I'm getting ready to show, it's not funny either. You see, He's pointing to something very powerful here. Jesus is showing a need that they hadn't really even thought about. There's a labor. We might talk about the labor later. Labor, L-A-B-E-R. This is the temple for the priest to go to before they, before they do what they're doing before God. They wash their hands and their feet. When I talk about that, there's that. But Jesus is taking it to a whole different level. A whole different level. That was before you went to the sacrifice. This is Jesus is the sacrifice. Very powerful. So let's just look a little bit. Let's just look at this a little bit. Bathhouses. In that day, because of the lack of always having to run in the water, or maybe not be able to get to a well, or they had to go up on a hill to get the water from the well and bring it back, then they had bathhouses. And these bathhouses, people go in there and take their bath.
So they go in the bathhouse and they take their bath. They would come out and be clean all over. But they had to walk to their house. So as they walk to their house, they pick up dirt and debris. So by the time they get to their house, they didn't need to bathe all over. They just needed to wash their feet. Now this is what Jesus is talking about, but he's gone so deep. Because it's a picture of a Christian. Our bathhouse before God is salvation. We can't get anywhere but Him. So, we get salvation. And when we get salvation, we come out clean. We're clean as a vessel. But as we walk through the world, we pick up attitudes. Somebody say attitudes. 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 We pick up attitudes and debris. We sometimes are collateral damage. Sometimes we pick up shrapnel. So, as we pick all this stuff up, ours is usually manifested in our attitude. Attitude isn't a thing. Your attitude is everything. Can I say that again? Your attitude isn't a thing. Your attitude is everything. I, I'll say this so many times, and, and you see it all over the place. Your attitude determines your altitude. Of course, on the plane, the attitude are the rudders. When the rudders on the plane are pointed down, the plane goes down. When the attitude is up, the plane goes up. The same way in your own life, when you've got a bad, stinking attitude, everything you do is affected by that attitude. It's a very, very powerful thing. Remember, your, att your attitude, so look at somebody tell them, your attitude is not a thing. Tell them. Your attitude is everything. Your attitude is everything. Amen. And so, 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 so here we go. I'm not going to, this is part one, because this is so rich, so full. I, I'm amazed that, that when the Lord showed this to me, and we got communion today, and this is right after, you know, after when Jesus is washing their feet. Matter of fact, they didn't time it. They didn't wash their feet when they walked in the room. He washed their feet after the meal. Wait a minute. The service was washed feet when you come in. But in this meal, he sees attitude after attitude after attitude. Judas is now accepting the mission. All this stuff's going on at the table. He puts Judas beside him to show his attitude. How great attitude. He puts Judas right beside him in a place of honor. Knowing that he was going to betray you. <laughs> Jesus was showing the greatest example of attitude while everybody else thought, I'm better than he is. I've done more than you have. Well, you know, Jesus loves me more. Wow. Can you imagine being at the Last Supper? We see that picture of the Last Supper, and it looks like everybody's looking over saying, Can I get another biscuit, please? They ain't asking for a chicken leg. They ain't asking for a wing. They're going, I'm better than you are. I'm the man. I mean, I'm the one. So, so you, you see all this stuff going on. Now, now, watch this. Let's get this to make this move a little bit deeper. Ready? The very first thing that's kept me. Ready? This is this is this is gonna be a little aggravating, but here it goes. We're gonna go to Luke 22. I already written it down there for you. Luke 22. It says they were arguing and they were accounted, accounting who was the best. Here it is. Jesus is needing help. And they're arguing about who's the best. Really? Jesus is telling you to get ready to die, and all you can think about is who's the best? Wow. And then what accountability means to keep count on basis of merit. And then, Jesus says, calm down here, homie boy. You're getting ready to deny me, because I'll never deny you. I'm a super Christian. He said before, the God grows, you'll deny me three times. So I'm going to step on to decide who is the greatest. 
but they're also comparing each other and they're comparing their own self to what with the situation and they become overconfident. So, step back and step away. Come on back here, bro. Come on back, step back here, step back. There we go. Proverbs 8 or 16 and 18. Pride comes before destruction. And an arrogant spirit before fall. When I see somebody get spiritual pride or get arrogant, I'm honest and start. I do. I start looking around for life. I've seen ministers do it. I've seen Christians do it. And when I see them do it, it always just shakes me to the core. Because they don't realize they're wearing a gas mask trying to protect themselves, but the gas is on the inside, not the outside. Wow. So now, step in pride, and then it's step in anger. Because the Bible said in Luke 20, too, that they were arguing about who was the greatest. There, were, there was a strife going on. That word strife in the Greek is to be quarrelsome. So they just didn't say, I'm the greatest, or you're the greatest, blah, blah, blah. They were arguing about who was the greatest. Can you imagine saying this something with Jesus? He's telling you he's getting ready to die, and y'all are arguing about who's the greatest. And you can't quit arguing. Wow. See, here's the test of a quarrelsome spirit. Ready? I'm going to tell you. How can you tell if you got a quarrelsome spirit? First instinct, if you got a quarrelsome spirit, the first instinct is to criticize. Your last instinct is to encourage. You find fault in everything, and you actually move on to a critical spirit, the danger zone. You're caught in a never-ending trap. It's going around and around and around. Criticize, criticize, find fault, criticize, find fault. Then all of a sudden you're critical, critical, critical. You're quarreling all the time. That happens in marriages. That happens in families. It happens at work. It's like this. You go to a ball game. And then the ball game, everything is going your team's way. Your team is winning. And when your team is winning, nothing hurts. The guys are out there playing, just got popped in the mouth with the baseball, his teeth are hanging out, he goes, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm getting ready to bat, I gotta keep on bat. Guy gets pulled up in the bed, in the butt, I mean, in the middle by a line drive, he goes, oh, 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 they're going, that's the little part there. That man's the man. Look at how he's calling that ball. Just right. But then go next to the side that's losing. When you win, nothing hurts. And the referees are awesome. When you're losing, everything hurts. Now you get your finger, a splinter in your finger off one of those bats. You're like, I can't play anymore, coach. And I should say, take me out. And every call to red face, you argue with the reds. Let me ask you a question. Do you find yourself losing? Do you find yourself having a bad attitude? Do you find yourself having a critical spirit? Because if you got a critical spirit, I'm telling you, everything hurts. I'm not talking about discerning something wrong. There's a difference if something's wrong and you're trying to fix a problem. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about attitudes. Attitudes. When I worked at the all I ever got was problems. That was it. That was my job. Corrective action manager, uh, safety manager, uh, 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 environmental uh, director. Everything was always problems. And I worked all these problems all the time. Every time I went to my desk, there was problem, 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 problem. <laughs> But I didn't let that affect my attitude. So now, 
I'm getting ready to close. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Can you sit back and now let to say that you've never been that way before? I can't say I haven't been that way before. I have. Certain people, I can have the greatest of days and hear somebody's name and all of a sudden. I know I'm not as holy as y'all. I can have a good day. And all of a sudden, I run up on this person. And I know that just did me wrong, did my family wrong, and seems like nothing's happening bad to them, and it's all we took the fall, and I find myself doing this. Wow. The Bible says in Jeremiah for pride, Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, let not the mighty man boast of his might, but let him boast, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, talking about God. That's my boast in my life, is what God can do. And wrath, beloved, do not never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, Venus is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So when you, when you find yourself giving in the pride, Another way you can tell you give me the prize when your song starts being like this. How great I am. How great I am. <laughs> Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians 4, 29. Ready? We have a choice. <coughs> Selfish or selfless? I got blue jeans on that guy right there because I actually, in my mind, both of these guys wear blue jeans. The only difference is the one that's not wearing blue jeans in that picture, he's wearing that because he's being more like Christ than he could ever be. Washing feet's got a whole lot more to do than just washing somebody's feet. It's an attitude. Choose wisely. I will tell you the story and then we're getting ready to get ready to pray. One rainy day during the American Revolution, George Washington rode up on a group of soldiers attempting to raise a wood, wood beam to his highest position. The corporal in charge was shouting encouragement, but the soldiers couldn't get the beam in position. <clears throat> After watching their lack of success, Washington asked the corporal why did he join in hell? <clears throat> to which the corporal replied, don't you realize that I am a corporal? Very politely, George Washington pulled back his robe and revealed who he was. He said, I beg your pardon, Mr. Corporal. I did. Washington dismounted his horse and went to work with the soldiers to get the boat beam in position. After they finished, George Washington wiped the perspiration from his face and said, if you should need help again, call on Washington. Your commander in chief, I will come. Power. 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 The corporal was over here with the mask. George Washington was over there washing his feet. BJ, we used to come here and play something soft and grow. It's so important. And I ask God all the time, God, help me keep this attitude. And we're going to talk more about it next week. We're going to go deeper into it next week. But this is just, this is more or less the intro. Not only 
did Jesus have it all? He created all. Think about it. He just, just didn't have it all. He created all. The angels that ministered to him when he was in the garden, he created those angels. The cross that he was about to get put on, he created that cross. The soldiers that were going to nail him to it, the crowd that was going to cry, crucify, crucify. He created all that. And he knew that they were going to turn on him. But he knew that he had to keep that good servant attitude. I get amazed. When I see people thinking they're too good to help somebody else. Abraham Lincoln said, you're going to test a man's integrity. Don't take everything away from him. You want to test his integrity, give him power. That's how you test it. Today, I want you to dig down deep.